Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Ian. Uh, today I'll be presenting on uh, acoustics for the home uh, and also about uh, getting the best out of your uh, hi fi recording studio at home. So, mainly we are, we are focusing on the home as uh, uh, we'll be covering th things like uh, sound uh, isolation, soundproof denial, or soundproofing, and also on uh, acoustic uh, treatment of your room. Um, the topic is actually quite vast. I realized uh, when I wrote the brief, I thought I could squeeze everything in today, but I think uh, uh, I might have to uh, shorten down some of the parts and give more time to, for you to ask questions. That would be, that'd be fine. Uh, and uh, let me start with a little bit of introduction. I've, I'm, uh, I have 15 years of uh, professional experience in sound and music. Uh, I started recording when I was 14 and I got my first professional job at 18, just before Harmony. And um, uh, I've been doing, I built my first studio when I was 21. So uh, from then on, uh, I uh, progressed and uh, helped people to uh, install uh, their home theatres or, uh, or design their home studios or professional recording studios. And even uh, nowadays I do auditoriums and uh, Cinemas. So um, I have uh, I have my background is I have also besides audio engineering, I also uh, a jazz keyboardist and I compose and also I teach music in US previously. Uh, okay, first to begin with acoustics, we need to take a look at these two pictures. You can see this is a concert hall and this is like art gallery. Which room has better acoustics? Everyone will say the one with the wood finisher. Actually, in this case, I mean, okay, in normal cases, I would, if, we, if you give me two pictures like that, I would say I have to hear it and measure it to uh, see uh, whether it has better acoustics. But um, in this case, this picture is a famous uh, hall in the UK called Robert, uh, at Royal Albert Hall. It's renowned for bad acoustics. But you see, because of the wood finish, you think that it has good acoustics. So, uh, and then this side looks like art gallery. Art gallery has the worst acoustics, usually. You go in there, you speak, and the whole thing, you can hear all the echoes and all that. So, but this case, I wasn't going to choose this picture. These walls are actually specially treated with uh, acoustic plaster. So actually it's been uh, already acoustic treated and it shouldn't have that much reverberation. So it might be, this room might be a better acoustic. So what I'm trying to say here is, uh, whether it sounds good or not, or has better acoustics, has nothing to do with the looks, first thing. Has nothing to do with the materials. It's how you design it. How you actually uh, allocate the, uh, uh, whether you use wood together with other materials, how you balance the different materials in the room. Uh, that is uh, more important than actually the material itself. So this is the first thing I want to uh, just bring up. Uh, and because it's a very common misconception. Usually you see wood, you say, wow, pussy must be good. But might not be true. Okay. <coughs> okay, first, I want to bust the first myth of soundproofing. Soundproofing actually does not exist yet. In, uh, maybe in the future someone can perfect and really be soundproof, but currently it does not really exist. Yeah, there's no such thing as soundproof. Soundproof is not like waterproofing, you do the waterproofing on the floor, then the water will leak to the next room. Soundproofing, whatever, no matter how much you do, it will still leak to the next room. So that is not really proof. It's just isolated or resistant, you know, like water, water resistant, for example. So, uh, one example, this is Galaxy Studios, Belgium, holds the current world record in sound isolation, 100 on 7 decibels between each room with a wall that is not more than 60 cm. It's quite a record. Actually, for me, I, I don't know how they managed to do it. It's, uh, it's quite a, a, a feat on its own. Uh, of course, it's possible to come up with such a solution, but the cost and the uh, and all that would be uh, a, lot, a lot. It would be really very high. And uh, so, even here, you can see it only achieved 100.7 decibels. Decibels is a measure of sound. Uh, if I want to talk about decibels, we can talk one whole night. But decibels 
just you need to know is a measure of the loudness for the layman. Okay, so 100 decibels of reduction means if I have a sound of 100 decibels uh, in that room, the next room can't hear anything. Zero. Okay, but if I have, let's say, something like a nuclear blast in there, which could be 200 decibels and more, more uh, you could still hear 100 decibels on, in the next room. So it's not really soundproof. This is the other concept I want to uh, bring across. So there's no such thing as soundproofing. And even the world record, still, if you were to fire uh, maybe a big pistol in there, the next room you probably can hear a bit. <coughs> Next, when we talk about uh, sound transmission, uh, there are different types of sound transmission. The two basic types we usually do with is airborne sound, which uh, carries through the air. As I'm, as, I, as I'm speaking now, the sound travels through the air to, to your seated positions. So this is airborne transmission of sound. The other one is called structure borne transmission, which or structural transmission, which means that uh, uh, the sound is actually trans transmitted through solid structures. For example, uh, uh, you jump on the floor and your neighbor can hear you. So that is uh, structural transmission, usually more than uh, airborne. But of course, airborne can become structural bond and structural bond can become airborne when it's very strong, the sound transmission level is very strong. So uh, these are some noise that, uh, not noise, sound that uh, uh, transmission that we need to be aware of. Then we look at how we actually um, uh, measure or have a standard for sound isolation. Uh, today I'm just going to cover, uh, the, the, because I don't want to get too technical with this, thing, but just for you to know that the common ones that are uh, used in the market, usually in, in US they use uh, STC, called Sound Transmission Class. It's an integer rating, so if you say 40 STC means that it's uh, on average um, about 40 decibel reduction in your uh, wall, uh, wall partition. But it doesn't mean that it's 40 decibel exactly because it's a curve, it's a reference curve. So some frequencies are weighted more than certain frequencies. Frequencies, what I mean by frequencies is low frequencies are like, uh, for example, your subwoofer. You hear those, uh, some Chongsa's car always go past, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, that's, uh, that's space frequency. High frequencies, for example, something high pitch. Uh, like a whist, very high pitch whistle or something, so that's high pitch. So, like, you know, so the weighting is different at different frequencies. So if someone were to go to your house and say, oh, I built a STC 40 wall for it and I can prove it, and you just take the sound meter and just measure, and just take back a sound source on one side and just measure the difference, and you say, oh, I've achieved 40, that's, that's impossible. You, he actually needs to go back and plot the graph and to find out exactly what's the STC. So the other thing that we measure impact uh, insulation, uh, usually for floors, is uh, uh, it's called impact insulation class, IIC, and it's also a US standard. Uh, the Europeans counters that uh, the uh, standard for equivalent standards are RW and RMTW, but there are more standards than this. So I'm not going to go into that. These are simple standards which you will come across if you plan to do soundproofing and you get a, for example, a soundproofing company, local company, you want them to do it for you, uh, then they propose you a wall, usually they will come with some specs similar to, to this. So you can base uh, your uh, requirements based on those uh, reference. Okay, so there's a misconception usually among architects here which I have uh, encountered that says that um, uh, the lab test STC has to perform in the field, in the, in the uh, in actual build situation, equal results. So uh, I think um, uh, this is a very big misconception, so I'm going to just pass this myth through because there is no such thing, it's almost impossible. Near, okay, I wouldn't say impossible, it's possible, but it would take a lot more cost to, uh, to actually achieve the same as the lab. It's almost like building a lab another lab out for the room that is... Uh, so the cost is, is definitely not... So it's, uh, they need to accept that it's um, within 5 to 8 point difference between the lab and the... Because lab is ideal conditions, they float everything, the walls are floated, floor floated, everything floated. So it's a very ideal situation. Uh, so they get um, uh, 
they can measure the SEC very accurately. But uh, in the field, when you're actually building it in your house, you know, it's, it's definitely lower than that. Sometimes I see in even normal house, our wall built, for example, they always say, BCA says that most of our wall built, uh, uh, recommended wall builds in most of our homes are actually, uh, let's say for drywall is about maybe 42 to 45 maybe, around there. Uh, but the way that it's been installed and the way it has been uh, constructed might not actually reach the 42 to 45. Not might not, definitely will not. Actually, <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to say definitely will not reach 42 to 45. Uh, and there's no real BCA standard for that currently. Yeah, it's more like uh, um, uh, usually HDB does something and then everyone follows. So the contractor all will follow and then the rest of the houses also will follow. Maybe condominiums, some of them might have different requirements. But uh, in general, uh, most of the wall builds are quite similar from what I see. Yeah. And um, uh, so this you need to be aware of because let's say if you were to get a new home or something, then you realize uh, we frequently get caught in uh, for problems like uh, uh, the room in between the two rooms, you can actually hear each other talking quite clearly. Yeah, um, this is a very common problem in, in Singapore because there's no real standard for acoustics. And uh, one reason why I'm, I'm here talking about this tonight is actually to adv advocate more awareness of such uh, uh, requirements. And uh, uh, because the government side, I think, will, will take a while to actually implement all this. And uh, by the time your, your house will be built, so. Uh, let's look at what we mean by the different levels of uh, STC, for example. So, okay, for the now 42 to 45, it means that uh, subjective description of effectiveness is uh, uh, medium loud speech is clearly audible, occasional words understood. So, uh, this means that uh, if you speak at a medium loud level, your neighbor should be able to hear you, uh, but cannot understand you totally. Maybe some words can catch one or two words. And, yeah, this is uh, usually 42 to 45 at this level. And this assumes that the background noise is uh, relatively quite quiet. So later I'll explain about the background noise, plan, but now uh, we take it as this. So in order to reach, for example, you want to be able to play your uh, uh, home theater system super loud and uh, and be able to not disturb your neighbors, you need to reach at least uh, uh, 75 decibel, uh, uh, 75 SDC, sorry. And actually, no need. 65 and above usually is quite good already. But it also depends on how loud you play your, your uh, home theater. So uh, this is important too. And uh, 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 one thing to note, which I forgot to put in the slides, was that uh, STC only measures uh, 125 hertz and above. Which means that uh, it doesn't take into consider consideration the low frequencies I mentioned just now, like the, um, the subwoofers, the home theater explosions, and uh, and uh, um, uh, for example, if you like uh, uh, some gaming kind of uh, music and all that, it's, it's a lot of lows. So uh, it doesn't take that into consideration in the measurement of STC. So uh, means that even if you have a super high STC, but your low frequency might not be well taken care of. So usually we need to. Yeah, when you need to control low frequencies, you really need to get an acoustic uh, expert in. Usually, most contractors uh, can't, can't really perform at this uh, at that level. <clears throat> this is another myth that I want to bust because I realize a lot of my uh, just a lot of in in Singapore, the acoustic uh, uh, um, industry is very. Uh, uh, in the infancy stage, we did not not really. It started a long, long time ago, but uh, it's getting more popular nowadays. More and more people are being aware of it. Uh, but um, there's a lot of misinformation in the industry, based on uh, uh, some contractor here say internet, some article. Uh, we must be always. Uh, uh, aware that the fact is more important because most of all these are just hearsay and um, could be an opinion, could be a, just trying to sell you a product. So they always say that, oh, you, die, you must use this material to achieve your soundproofing, for example. 
actually that statement is only true to maybe half. In certain situations, you might need certain materials because you want a thinner wall, but you still want to achieve a high, uh, as they say, certain materials you need to use. But other than that, in most situations, if you have no limit of uh, space or no limit of, uh, um, uh, actually, most material, any material, common building materials can achieve a pretty good uh, STC usually. Uh, so, to prove this, look at this four wall building. So, okay, it's a cross section. So you can see. Let me explain the strips you see uh, are drywall. These are the walls that most of your homes are built with. Inside is what we call insulation, which is usually fiberglass, rock wool, or some sort of uh, absorbent material, sound absorbent material, fireproof material. Uh, so, uh, and this box here is uh, just a structure. So it could be wood, wooden stuff. But in Singapore, we use metal studs. Okay? Uh, so, you can see all this use the same number of materials, but the STC are different because the the way it's been designed, the design is more important than actually the materials itself. Again, it's not about the materials. Yeah. So you can see this wall here actually it has what we call a triple leaf, quadruple quadruple leaf effect. So. Uh, you can look at it and then I will explain that too, too much to explain. Uh, and the, this is a double leaf and this one is a triple leaf. So usually we aim for a double leaf in the construction of uh, 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 any wall. Uh, usually that is the most uh, how do I say that, effective in terms of uh, being able to achieve the maximum effectiveness within the space plus the uh, um, materials. So, uh, yeah, you, you need to see, you need to understand that sometimes certain contractors tell you, oh, I'll just, so you have a current wall, for example, in your home. Then you say, some of not good enough. Can I add? So, some contractors say, no problem, I pick one more wall for you. But the problem is, he didn't remove one side of the wall and you just add on to a wall and it has this effect. So there's actually a lower STC than what it should be. Yeah. So by right all all these materials you can achieve this. But instead this is achieved. Okay. The wall is the one Now the wall this is a cross section. So this is uh, this is your uh, drywall. This is your insulation cleaning and this is the structure. So uh, it's a top view like I would say top view is easier to see. Yes, correct. Yeah. This is a double wall. Uh, for to reach SDC 60, you need double walls. But most of our homes are, contract, uh, are constructed in single walls. So at most, I think in our homes, we can achieve is about 50 plus SDC yeah, for single wall. Unless you want to up, you need to uh, do a double wall, which takes up space. And uh, in the homes nowadays, with the space so small, it's uh, luxury. Like, but sometimes you might want, because if you are doing a home studio, or you plan to make your home theater, like uh, loud or not that, so you, need, you probably need double wall. Yeah. But in this situation, it proves that actually the materials doesn't doesn't really matter. Not doesn't really matter. It matters, but it's it's only part of the, the solution. It's not the whole thing. So I often hear this: oh, the system uh, we install this wall in, for example, Yamaha School. We install this wall in. Da da da, it has been tried and tested in the lab. We have the te lab test report as well as uh, all that. Sure, no problem. Most of the time, there's problem. And usually, they call me in the result, which sometimes I get pretty frustrated because uh, uh, it's, uh, it shouldn't be that way in the first place. Um, okay, this picture proves that, uh, not proves that, it shows the sneaky sound paths that uh, the sound can go through. So, every site is different. So every room is different. The size of the room, the volume of the room, the uh, whether there's an aircon duct sharing between the two rooms, whether there's a, a common shared space above for wiring and lighting, uh, whether there are windows. Uh, so what this shows that, for example, the first, first path, number one, is the direct path. So this path goes from a sound source, for example, if a very loud, uh, speaker, we play back, it goes through direct through the wall to the other side. So this will be reduced by the wall, the direct uh, transmission. Then 
we have other things what we call flanking transmissions. Uh, flanking transmissions actually go through, uh, uh, usually is going through shared um, uh, structural, uh, structural, uh, um, uh, how do I say, structure, structure, flooring, for example, ceiling, for example. So usually, they will, if you have a shared flooring, for example, between this room, most of the time that's the case, and you would have problems uh, transferring between the floor because it actually transmit through this hard structure and goes through. So no matter how good your wall here is, it will still go through here. Unless you take care, you decouple the floor. We will call it totally the floor, then you might, might uh, remove it. it. It depends on design and all that again. Yeah, so this is uh, uh, all, all the sound bring. And also the third one I want to mention is the, uh, if you have a shared uh, ducted aircon, sometimes certain private homes have ducted aircons that are shared between rooms. And uh, uh, this actually needs to take into consideration because the sound can actually travel through that duct. If there's no insulation in between the absorb the sound and all that, you will definitely transmit. Yeah, so then the other room right here, the room I've done so much uh, sound moving, but yet I still can hear. Sometimes it's through the aircon system. Yeah, and usually you need to especially design those. Uh, windows is another weakness. Windows and doors are common weaknesses. Uh, windows currently, you can see a lot of uh, contractors just say, oh, I put double glazed glass, uh, that's good enough. But actually, in true fact, the double glazed unit can only achieve STC maybe 28, uh, and in the field probably lower, like 20. So it's not very, a very good, uh, uh, um, how do you say that, uh, uh, sound isolation uh, uh, material. Uh, but glass can be spec'd to be a high, uh, a high sound isolation. But the person specking it must know how to play around with the air gap and the uh, type of glass and even that. So those are uh, more specialized skills which uh, I won't go into details in. But you need to uh, look out for your windows, your doors. So usually sometimes in homes, we have this problem whereby um, we hear a lot of sound from the corridor. Yeah, This is uh, a common thing. Usually you, you solve the door, it usually becomes quite acceptable. But the doors are very expensive. In the industry standard uh, for a soundproof door, let's say a wooden one. A wooden one can probably, let's say STC, maybe 40 above, usually cost at least 3K plus above one door. So this is, a, this is a standard. And if you want to go even higher, you need metal doors. Metal doors are at least in the market, cheapest you can find is probably, without fire rating, it's probably about 8K for one door. 8,000 for one door. So doors are very, very expensive in some people. But there are many ways to get around the door, but you need to give up space and all that, which I won't go into that, but uh, and most of the time in homes, you wouldn't want to give up space because you're a big room already. You know, not that big, so you don't want to give up room. We can do double door system, which use, uh, but both needs to buy what we call acoustic seals. Acoustic seals are, uh, you, so you see those rubber thing around doors sometimes, if you see acoustic doors. Uh, those are seals to prevent the, uh, the sound from escaping through the air, the gaps between the door. So you might say that, oh, a small gap, but uh, why do I need to take care of this small gap? It's just a small gap. A small gap sometimes can leak as much as 10 decibels or more, 15 even sometimes, uh, of sound through that little gap. Let's say a 10 mm gap, let's say, maybe I forgot the uh, formula, but around 15 decibels, yeah, 10 mm gap. So it's, it's a. Uh, we, in, in other words, soundproofing is something you really need to be super OCD to do because uh, you need to take care of every single detail. Uh, so not only looking at the, the build, the design itself, you need to look at the, the, the actual site that you're actually doing the uh, soundproofing. You need to understand where are the weaknesses and all that. Uh, so, Uh, so for this uh, part, I will conclude and later if you have any questions, you can ask me about this. Uh, next, I want to cover is background noise. 
So for example, if I'm in a, in a very quiet environment, when I first started doing soundproofing, I wanted to do very high uh, isolation. So after I achieved the high isolation, I realized some of my customers are not happy. The reason is because the room has become so quiet that when they sit inside the room, they close the door. Outside, just a little bit of sound they can hear. Just a little bit. It becomes like, uh, um, uh, how do I say that? They are oversensitive because there's a lack of noise. For example, if I were to play noise, now I start to speak, you, you at least start to hear the act of my, it becomes less clear. It's the same thing, so let's say in a quiet environment, you can hear me very clearly, but in a noisy environment, so sometimes you have like echo noise and all that, it helps to uh, make it less uh, needed to have high STC requirements, because uh, the noise is not as, uh, how do I say that, uh, it will influence your subjective uh, hearing. Yeah. So this is uh, important, so when the room is quiet, the, they will be very sensitive. So, um, but some in some situations, for example, like recording studio, you need to be quiet because uh, recording studio we have, we are aiming to record the sound as pure as possible without any noise. Uh, so in that situation, uh, then we need to actually control the noise in a different way. We really need to plan out how the studio is laid out uh, so that they won't get disturbed by any small little noise. And get into the recording. So that one is a design issue again, so I won't go too deep into that. And background noise is usually measured by something called NC or NR. Um, this is, uh, uh, and then there are other variants like NCB, which uh, are yeah, quite pop, uh, commonly used in the industry. Uh, usually they use to measure like uh, a room, for example, like this, they will switch on the aircon, uh, they will switch on the projector. Any other, maybe uh, AV equipment or something, they switch it on, but without playing anything. Just uh, then they record the noise in the, in the room. And they will plot it against a graph again. Uh, the graph somewhere can be a little bit high. But uh, it's against a graph. So as long as the, the sound, the background noise falls below that graph, it is within that particular NC. So if that's NC30, there's a particular graph. If it's, all your noise are below it, it's okay. Once you, one frequency exceeds, the, uh, uh, the standard curve, then you will have to move to the next level, so become NC35, for example. Uh, so this is uh, uh, a type of measurement that uh, NC is US, NR is Google. So uh, this is how they measure noise. Okay, so let's look at case study, uh, which I think can better relate. Uh, <laughs> I can hear my neighbor walking above me. This is the most common complaint. Uh, we get a lot of calls, uh, such things. But uh, there's good news, there's bad news for this. Uh, the, the good news is, by right, I feel, this is my personal opinion, again, okay? personal opinion, it's the developer's responsibility to ensure that this don't happen. Walking, just normal walking, you can hear, is ridiculous. We're not even talking about standard, but this is like, this is, this is definitely really good. And I see it even in the most expensive orchard condos. You'll be surprised. This happens and I say, oh, this is ridiculous. I mean, you should just complain to your developer and ask them to resolve this because uh, it shouldn't be you pay, paying. If one thing is very expensive. One thing is almost impossible to isolate this sound. There's two reasons why. One reason is because the, the neighbor's on top. So he's already living there. And you want to, let's say, the best uh, how do I say, the solution is always to treat the source. So the source is the floor above. It's easier to, to treat it above than to actually do it from the ceiling. But it's still possible to do from the ceiling. But the problem is, because the floor is connected to the breathing structures, so even if you do the ceiling, the sound will still uh, come down through your walls. So don't tell me you need to do your whole room and then lose a lot of room and all that. And, and that's, that's not fair. I, I feel this could be something that uh, the developers should resolve and should be responsible for. This one, uh, I think it's, it's good that uh, uh, more people become aware of this. Because most people don't know, they just accept it as it is. I have another case uh, whereby a condo, is also a condo, right next to a major road. The developer actually has done some due diligence, but they forgot one thing. Is, uh, 
because they designed it nice, so they want two pieces of glass coming this way, and because the joint of the glass is not done properly, the noise in the morning is very loud from the traffic. So the person can't see when they ask me why, and I measure the wow, this is way big, above even what is acceptable. So I ask them to just go straight to the developer to resolve this. Yeah, because there's no, there's no point for me to recommend a solution that, for example, adding another set of windows which limits their space and all that. And this is also the same thing. If, if, even if I were to do the ceiling, it wouldn't uh, resolve the problem 100%. It's only 50%. I can resolve whatever sound that's coming through the ceiling, direct through the ceiling, but I cannot resolve any sound that actually is spread through the structures. And because most of the footsteps, uh, this is based on scientific testing, are actually very low frequency. Actually, sub, sub base frequencies, they are even harder to treat than uh, a normal frequency. So it's uh, actually very tricky to do this. So this problem actually, if you have a unit like this, my advice is to move out. Yeah. If when, when the five years, uh, after the five years. Yeah. Um, have there been any instances where you consulted for your clients and they brought the case of the case later as well? I have one case which, uh, ah, this next one. The water running, the water pipe running next to the bed. This is a design flaw again. Uh, it happens in also a condominium. So the architect or the engineer uh, may not be the architect because sometimes the architect designs and the engineer takes care of the, the piping. And they run it through uh, right next to the bedroom. And, and this plan was quite quite poor thing because uh, uh, what happened was the holes between the two pipes, uh, the two levels, were misaligned. So the pipe is at an angle like this. So what happened was it, it keeps leaking. <laughs> it keeps leaking and it keeps leaking and it's like... She's going crazy. Already. So besides that, so okay, they, they at last resolve the problem. They use a a rather uh, okay like you, you can resolve the problem. They actually concrete um, fill the bottom with an L shaped uh, kind of uh, pipe. So this shape. So now the misalignment no longer occurs because you have an L shape like that. But now you have another problem. The sound becomes the sound will hit the pipe there and it will be super loud. So so. Uh, um, uh, this one, we resolved it, but uh, I did tell my client, my client was so frustrated about this that she wanted no noise even on the toilet side. So imagine this pipe is in between the toilet and the bedroom, the master bedroom. So she wants no noise even in the toilet side, she says. But I told her it can't be possible because of that concrete field part. It, it causes the structural transmission thing that I, I, I covered earlier. So the, the sound actually travels through the structure, no matter what you do, doesn't, doesn't uh, work. But what I can do for her is to uh, isolate the sound from uh, on the bedroom side as much as I could. I, I did uh, the coupling of the wall, and then, but she lost some floor space, which is quite a thick wall, and so on, uh, but we resolved this. But uh, this again, the developer took responsibility for the cost. Yeah. Which uh, I, I think uh, this is one of the cases. <laughs> and next one is uh, <laughs> home theater gaming karaoke sound system is driving me nuts. Okay, this one is also another common complaint that we receive. Usually in this situation, uh, I would say you go to your neighbor to talk first. <laughs> because, okay, to to resolve this, you need to spend a lot of money. And I feel uh, it's not worth... Of course, I, I mean, being uh, in, working for a company, of course, they, if they sell the product, I'm happy. But the thing is, I, I don't want that to happen because uh, this um, situation requires a lot of cost, a lot of... Uh, you will lose a lot of room in your room because you need to build all these extra walls, ceiling, floor, you know, it become like uh, your whole bedroom becomes super small or you realize that or you want to prevent against this so your whole house you need to do. So imagine whole house the cost, just a typical, uh, just give you an idea of the cost of soundproofing one room, one bedroom. Uh, maybe easily 10,000, one bedroom. That is, uh, yeah, easily, yeah. Uh, there is a few reasons, one is material. Uh, one is because okay, in, that, in that kind of space you want to build your wall as thin as possible so you need to use certain materials that are not common uh, building materials. They are thinner 
like three, four mm, but they are denser. Uh, and uh, uh, also because of the floating, sometimes you need to float uh, certain things. Uh, the rubber or springs cost a lot. And also the construction itself is different from the normal drywall. So a lot of people think that um, a lot of contractors think that they can just build a normal drywall, but the detail required to build a soundproof wall is very different. So all the joints between the wall and the floor, the wall and the ceiling, all needs to be uh, properly actually left a, leave a gap and filled with uh, proper acoustic sealant. Or uh, it's, 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 a, it's a lot of cost. You think the sealant one one tube is at least I think 12, 13 bucks. That's the cheapest one probably. You no, know, that's still cheaper one, but about ten bucks, right? Uh, so it's one you use up very quickly in that sense when you start to fill those gaps. Yeah, and uh, the other thing is uh, uh, the time required to build is a lot more because the detail you don't just wrap it up and just anyhow screw in the thing and that's it. But you know, actually, you need to even I've seen some builders actually I uh, I think it, it does help, but not to a big extent. Is to actually leave. And even the screws have certain gaps that they fulfill, so like 300 mm between each other, and the and the two, then the two sides that you are two. Let's say for example, the two walls you are putting is actually staggered. Even <laughs> they will go to that kind of detail to increase the STC. So uh, it's a it's a lot of detail in, in, in building a sample wall that costs yeah time. Usually workers' time, and that's the main thing. Yeah. So this one, uh, I have one case also. Um, when early in my career, where I met this uh, 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 young couple who has this problem, uh, the neighbor below them have a old kind of fan mounted directly onto the structural beam. So the the da -da 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 actually transmit up to the bedroom. Yeah, actually this solution. First thing I told the person, can you just go down and tell me to buy a new fan or aircon even? Is cheaper than if you were to do a sample. And uh, but yes, the young couple has already tried all avenues, but the the neighbor refused to budge. So and for the sake of their young kid who is sitting in the room, uh, they have to do some moving instead. But we did warn them that the effect won't be hundred percent because structural bond. I could I can control the wall side, but the floor will still come. There will be some some coming through the floor even. So. Uh, uh, that one, I think we managed to reduce about 50 to 60 percent, enough for the kid to sleep, but not enough. Let's say you can still hear it at times because the the old fan is really very loud. Yeah. Um, and so in these various situations, you can see there are some cases which the developer needs to be responsible for. Some cases you actually need to negotiate with your neighbors. There's really no easy way out because soundproofing is is not cheap and it's not easy. Um, and when you can control the source, it's always uh, a plus point. When you go to the source, you tell them, oh, can you lower down the volume a bit or something? So that, that actually is, uh, although it might seem a bit common sense, but most people sometimes don't do that and they just call us straight away. But um, the thing is, we can't do much to resolve this. Because imagine if you were to do the whole house soundproofing, that, that would be at least 40,000, maybe 30,000. So it's definitely not worth, no one would spend that kind of money. We might as well move out. Yeah.